Yes. Okay. All right. So thanks, Hal, for that introduction. Um, I'm ready to, to start the webinar here. And I want to acknowledge before we get started, because we've got quite a bit to cover, my project co-PIs, uh, Professor uh, Jennifer Dill, Kelly Clifton, and Nathan McDeal, Nathan McNeil, and the two lead GRAs on the project, uh, Tara Goddard and Nick Foster. So, um, so a little bit about the, the overview, overview of the webinar. I'm going to give you an introduction and a little background to what facilities we evaluated, uh, a quick snapshot of our methodology, and then dig into three of uh, sort of the key findings uh, from the project related to change in ridership, um, some information on design, uh, particularly for intersections and buffers, and also about the community support and wrap up with uh, conclusions. So um, this slide is a, a few months uh, out of date, but uh, it gives kind of a sense of from when the NACTO uh, Urban Bikeway Design Guide was released uh, to when uh, this project uh, that we were evaluating the facilities that went in and as part of the People for Bike Screen Lane projects. But um, there are about, at the time of the slide was made, about 210 uh, facilities that have been installed in the U.S. in protected bikeways. So a pretty significant growth in the number of uh, these types of designs. So our, our objective uh, was to do a field-based evaluation of these uh, early adopters of protected bikeways, and you'll see photographs of these in the next uh, couple slides in five U.S. cities. We wanted to look at the safety uh, of users, both perceived and actual. Um, because of their relatively new installation date, there's not a whole lot of uh, reported uh, crash data to go on, so most of it, our analysis here is from, uh, from video analysis. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the, well, the objective was the, to look at some of the effectiveness of how the designs, because you'll see that there were quite a few different approaches, particularly at intersections, and then to see how residents and other use, road users perceive the facilities, and if we could get any evidence about uh, how these facilities appealed to the more casual cyclist. We had a, another objective to look at economic activity, um, but we're still uh, actually still working on that, uh, that piece. So let's, let's get an overview of the sites. So these, uh, <coughs> we're uh, five uh, U.S. cities, Washington, D.C., Chicago, Illinois, Austin, Texas, San Francisco, Cal California, and uh, Portland, Oregon. These cities were part of the inaugural Green Lane projects. Um, Memphis, Tennessee was also one of the first uh, Green Lane cities, uh, but they did not, uh, their facility did not get installed in time to be part of our evaluation. So what I, what I want to do now is just give you a sense of the facilities. These are just, I'm going to show you after shots of the facilities, and you'll see the different configurations. Down in the lower right of all the slides are the uh, sort of the cross sections of the facility as constructed. And then I've got some pictures to sort of, or some annotations to sort of show. So Austin, there were three, three facilities we looked at in Austin. The first was in, the first one is Rio Grande Street. It's adjacent to the University of Texas campus. Um, they installed a two-way bikeway on a one-way street. Um, to do that, they, may, they uh, eliminated uh, one vehicle lane, and there was, uh, um, prior to this, there was, a bike, there was a bike lane, but only in one direction, so only in the northbound direction. Uh, the second facility in Austin was on Blue Bonnet Lane. This was also a two-way facility, but it was on a two-way street, and it was in a very residential uh, area and uh, actually uh, was in front of an elementary school. To do this, they removed parking uh, on one side of the street. Um, about 150 spaces, uh, parking spaces were removed to make this facility. Um, the last facility in Austin was on Barton Springs Road. This was the this is the busiest and fastest traffic speed road in our evaluation. Um, this uh, they they it's a five lane cross section, um, so four vehicle lanes, two in each direction. Uh, they installed a one way bikeway. Um, they did that by narrowing all the travel lanes in the center turn lane, and you can see 
there's also a, a shared use path to accommodate bicycle travel in the other direction. We did not evaluate anything about that except for questions in the survey that related to that. Uh, we were only evaluating the on-road facility. Um, in Chicago, uh, the two facilities we evaluated were uh, Dearborn Street. This is a very, uh, this is in the downtown core in the loop. Um, also a two-way facility on a one-way street. They, uh, this has a parking protected buffer, so there's a parking lane adjacent to the bikeway, um, and the vehicle lanes are on the other side of the parking buffer. They did this primarily by removing uh, a vehicle travel lane. Um, the other facility in Chicago was North Milwaukee Avenue. This is a key commuter route on a radial northeast of the downtown core. Uh, it had heavy bike traffic uh, prior. This was the heaviest uh, trafficked facility in our study. Um, it had heavy bike traffic before uh, the installation of these protected bikeways, um, and it had heavy bike tra traffic afterwards. So on this, this was a one-way bikeway uh, on each side of the street, um, two-way vehicle lanes in the center, mostly parking buffer. Uh, they did this by removing parking, some center turn lanes, and some bus-only lanes. Uh, to fit these, uh, to fit the additional uh, space for protection, uh, the parking, uh, the buffer uh, for the facility. In Portland, uh, we evaluated Northeast Multnomah Street. Um, this is a classic road diet where it re removed two travel lanes um, and then installed these, uh, the one-way bikeway on each side of the street. You can see. <coughs> Uh, in this direction, which is a great picture taken by Nathan, uh, that uh, on one side they had enough space to basically put these planter buffers in, um, and then on the other side uh, there was a space buffer or, a, or those uh, post buffers. Um, and this facility actually added parking, so there were 30 spaces added. Uh, in, uh, the, in San Francisco, Oak and Fell were the, were the one-way couplet. Fell is the climbing direction. This is across the panhandle in downtown San Francisco. After you've, uh, if you're leaving downtown and you go through the wiggle, uh, this is going up to uh, JFK Park. Uh, and uh, so they removed uh, parking on one side of the street. This is a left side uh, one-way bikeway, uh, one-way vehicle lanes, um, and uh, it's a uh, post uh, post uh, flex post protected uh, bikeway. Um, the other street in San Francisco was a, is a parallel couplet. It's a one way couplet. This is a downhill grade, um, and uh, it also uh, this but this time it's on the it's on the right side. Um, but it's a one way bikeway on a one way street, and there are more. Uh, this particular section, because of the residential driveways, the flex posts or the buffer posts are not there. Uh, but for the most part, along this facility, there are posts separating the facility. Lastly, um, Washington, D.C. and L Street, uh, a one-way bikeway on a one-way street. Um, and uh, this, uh, they accomplished this by removing both parking and vehicles, vehicle lane uh, to per fit in the uh, the parking or to fit in the protected bikeway. So, so let's talk quickly about the methodology we used to evaluate these facilities. We used uh, uh, video data to get a lot of our information about user behavior uh, of the facility, both cyclists, drivers, and pedestrians, um, as well as uh, analyze the interactions of them. Um, we focused on intersections because that was the most interesting uh, that was the most interesting uh, piece and the most variety uh, to look at. So we had about three locations per facility. We didn't do any video collection in Austin. Um, they didn't have any intersection designs that matched with the other, the other cities. We had two views per location, two days of video per location. So we had about 170, 168 hours of video that we analyzed. And you can see the numbers 
of cyclists and turning vehicles that we observed across all of the different components. So there are a few things from the video evaluation that are in the final report that I'm not going to have time to cover today, um, but the final report is a wealth of information and I'll try and point that out if people have some questions about what is also in that report. We supplemented the video with uh, surveys and we did two surveys, one to residents uh, living near the new protected facilities. It was a fairly lengthy survey, 8 to 12 pages, about 40 questions. The response rate overall was 23%. Um, we did, for both of these surveys, there was an incentive uh, for a drawing $100 gift cards to Amazon.com. Um, and um, the bicyclist survey was done. These were bicyclists intercepted on the facility and directed to an online, uh, online survey where they could complete answers uh, about the facility and, and, and their general perceptions uh, of things. Um, and that response rate you know, had a higher 33% response rate. And that's uh, uh, in line with our previous uh, experiences with doing these intercept surveys. So just so overall when we see things now in the results, the resident survey was mailed to uh, residents living near the facilities. That's how we captured the opinions of people driving and walking as well as bicycling on the facility. And the cyclist survey were perceptions of people bicycling on the facility. So <clears throat> the four questions that we sort of looked at and we're going to go over today, you can see which uh, data was used in that analysis. And the one thing I haven't talked about yet was the count data. Uh, that was uh, a combination of data collected by the cities um, before and after, and the video data which we took was all after. Um, and so the durations of those were somewhat mixed. Some were short-term counts, two-hour counts, some were longer counts. Um, and some were doing good weather, um, so we had to do a bit of uh, combining of all of that count data to get a sense of the change uh, in ridership, which is which we'll go over first. So um, this slide shows the, the change in the observed bicycle volumes as best as we could estimate them. Um, and uh, the facilities that had bike lanes prior to the installation of the protected bikeway are on the left and the ones that uh, had no bike lanes uh, are on the right. And the two tall gray bars are facilities where before you could only travel legally on a bicycle in one direction and afterwards you could travel in two way in two directions. So that's why those counts are so much, uh, they have the higher percentages. But uh, across all the facilities, um, the, we observed an increase uh, in the observed counted uh, bicycle volumes. Um, and even for a facility like Milwaukee, which I mentioned was already a heavy commuter route, so it has a low, lowest percentage, but in terms of numbers, um, it's actually quite a, quite a large number of in, a change in the number of cyclists observed in the counting periods. Um, so one of the questions is sort of, well, where did those, uh, where did those trips come from? It's, uh, we, we had to sort of get at that from our surveys. And one of the questions we asked for intercepted cyclists was before the facility you would, was built, how would you have made this trip? So the blue bars on the bottom are, or so maybe the purple coloring on the top is people that would have bicycled on that same route before. And so it's ordered from sort of uh, left to right. And you can see, again, like the Milwaukee facility, uh, many of the people we intercepted were already using Milwaukee for that trip. The blue bar on the bottom, the blue bars on the bottom are people that were attracted to this route um, from another route. So they, they, they diverted their trip to use the protected facility. Um, and uh, for a facility like Dearborn, there was no bicycle lane prior. It's, uh, and so the provision of the two-way cycle track on uh, Dearborn uh, attracted a lot of people to use that route uh, for, for cycling. And then the red bars in the middle are sort of the, the, the possible sort of attraction um, of people that may have done some mode shifting. 
um, either from transit or from walking or driving possibly. So um, these facilities had been installed uh, relatively, uh, you know, they were in for less than a year. And I think some evidence that we've seen in, in our uh, other studies, especially work that Jennifer Dill has done, suggests that there that there's a little bit of a lag um, between when a facility would be installed and when you might see some change, some real uh, change in, in mode uh, behavior. So, so a lot of the increased volume that we saw on these facilities was primarily due to route shifting. Um, so, so, so one of the things that we also looked at is, you know, what would be one of the reasons that people would shift their route. Um, and uh, one of the you know clear findings from this study, from the perceptions of the intercepted cyclist, is that across all cities, um, across all the facilities, the percentage of cyclists saying that they felt the safety of bicycling on this street after the installation of the protected bikeways um, had either increased somewhat or increased a lot from their perspective. Um, and some of those are. Uh, you know, almost 98% uh, percent or so of the intercepted cyclist. So, um, so I, and I should mention, I think the intercepted uh, cyclist uh, was over, uh, was over a thousand uh, uh, data points uh, intercepted. Um, to sort of get a little bit deeper at that uh, about the attraction of the facility. We also, on the resident survey, we asked some questions that we were able to sort of place people in the uh, four types of cyclist category that was developed by Roger Geller here at the City of Portland as a planning sort of way to look at the cyclist uh, types. So based on questions we asked in the survey, we could put them into the sort of the strong and fearless type cyclist, the sort of enthused and confident cyclist, uh, or that sort of demographic uh, in the middle there, the interested but concerned, who who would like to cycle more for transportation, but they have some concerns about uh, either safety or other things that are keeping them from using a bicycle for transportation. And then, of course, there's the population that uh, is the that that uh, no way, no how. So a lot of this you'll see in a couple of different slides. We were able to sort of break the responses down by these types to sort of get at, you know, is there an appeal across the different cycling uh, planning types uh, towards these facilities? And we asked a general question about, would you be more likely to ride a bicycle if more vehicles and bicycles uh, were physically separated by a barrier? And about 85% of the interested but concerned residents uh, agreed, uh, either somewhat or strongly agreed uh, with that statement. So some evidence that these facilities appeal more broadly to that interested but concerned uh, type. Um, we also looked at uh, gender, uh, some gender differences. Probably the thing to focus is on the right column, the f which is the sort of the overall. Uh, we asked the question about because of the blank bike separated bikeway, how often they ride a bicycle overall, so not just on the facility, but sort of a general overall cycling rate. Um, and women were statistically more statistically significant, more likely to say uh, that either increased a lot or increased somewhat um, than men. And um, and you can see it was sort of consistent across the cities, this sort of gender split, but some some differences. So another data point about sort of that, the appeal of these facilities to, uh, to different uh, cycling types, in this case, uh, women cyclists. So let's get into a little bit of evaluation about the designs. So we looked at uh, uh, intersections uh, and then the use of bicycle signals at intersections and then a little bit about buffers. Um, and the intersections that where these protected bike lanes uh, approach intersections with turning traffics are divided into kind of two categories and you'll see pictures of them, either turning, what we call turning uh, zones or mixing zones. And then the ones in Chicago and Dearborn were fully signalized. Uh, separating all uh, movements, uh, vehicles, bikes, and pedestrians in time with a traffic signal. And then lastly, just talk a little a bit about buffers. There's 
quite a bit more in a paper that we just uh, that will be published in in the TRB TRR journal um, and in the report. So let's go through these different intersection designs. Um, that uh, this was the most interesting. The cities were at this you know uh, these are the early adopters. Uh, they were looking at different ways to do the designs, and this was a key piece of this uh, study was to evaluate how uh, these were being used. So um, we, uh, based on the markings and signing and the designer intents, designer intent, we assigned whether people's paths were the observed path through the through them through the intersection was either the correct path or not the correct path. And so um, this first design is in Washington, D.C. We called it a turning zone with post-restricted entry and a through bike lane. Um, I think I can uh, – let's see, I can use the highlighter. So uh, these black uh, circles here, these are the flex post. And so the protected bike lane is down here on the bottom on all these slides. Um, and then the posts start back up again here. So um, – So the the um, the bicycle on the protected lane uh, uh, comes up from the bottom and then merges over to this little pocket or through bike lane. Uh, the vehicle uh, merges uh, over from here into this spot into the left turn lane to make a to make a left turn. In this area here that I'm going to highlight on all the other designs is what we're calling the merging area. So for all of these designs, we sort of we looked at whether the bicycle or the motor vehicle took the correct path from the video through the intersection. We also asked some questions of uh, on the surveys about what the people perceive should be the what they should do, but I'm not going to present those in the interest of time in this webinar. Um, so the second design for these turning zones was in San Francisco, and the main difference here is that there are no, no more flex posts. So the vehicles could, the merging area where the cyclist is exposed to the merging of the vehicle is longer um, in, than, than, the, um, than in Washington, D.C. Um, but it's essentially the same design. The cyclist moves over, in this case it's a right turning, uh, it's a right turn location. The cyclist moves over from the left, and the vehicle moves over and merges uh, to turn right. The, the th there are three variations on mixing zones. Uh, this one uh, is in the is, uh, a design that's in the NACTO uh, guide um, in Portland uh, with this yield, uh, this clearly defined sort of vehicle yield entry point um, where the vehicles and bikes then mix in that right turning space. So bicycles and cars share that right turning space. In San Francisco, a little bit different, um, where they used green back sharrows uh, to mark uh, the mixing zone. So the protected bike lane just enters basically this mixing zone. Um, and there's a long merging area. And then uh, in San Francisco, the last design, which uh, actually they've, and you'll see uh, from the results, they, they've since removed this design and replaced it with the prior design at the two locations it was installed. But this had sort of green skip coloring across the whole mixing zone area. Um, and uh, vehicles and bikes shared that same space. So here's the, here's the quick summary of the results of that. Um, you can see that the um, that there's quite a bit of uh, variation in terms of, and you saw from the pictures whether it's left or right turning traffic. But there's also quite a bit of variation in the number of these are peak direction through bikes and turning vehicles per hour, and this is partly a function of the of the designer's choice when there was sort of low. Uh, turning volumes they elected for mixing zones and when there are high turning volumes they elected for the the turning zones and so um, just because of the study the facilities that we elected to study we weren't able to sort of pick and choose to get variations in uh, on the design volume thresholds uh, we were sort of evaluating the facilities as they were but this is kind of the clear 
the two sort of key columns, and I'll come back to this one in another slide. So um, the number of observed correct turning motorists who followed the correct path was highest uh, in the Portland design, um, where uh, almost 93% of the drivers entered that merging zone um, in that correct space. So they followed that um, they followed that uh, path into the mixing zone, um, but followed not far behind by the uh, post-restricted turning zones in uh, Washington D.C. Um, one thing to note is that the you know the mixing zones in in San or the turning zone in San Francisco without those posts had a much lower uh, correct turning motorists. So a lot of that was sort of late merging behavior um, into the into the mixing zone. But these two down here also had uh, either late merging or particularly in the case of the last Felon Baker, a lot of vehicles never actually would enter the mixing zone and would turn left from the adjacent lane. Um, in terms of the through bicyclist use, again the the DC type design had the highest percentage of uh, bicyclists following the correct path, um, but the uh, um, the San Francisco design without the post also had correct a lot of a high number percentage of bike, bicyclists following the correct path. In the uh, Portland design, um, one thing that we observed a lot of was that cyclists um, cyclists. Uh, use this space actually. So even though it's meant to just be a separation between the two travel lanes, many cyclists moved over and waited in this space to continue through. Not an unreasonable uh, behavior um, and not necessarily, and I should mention that our observed correct behavior didn't necessarily mean it was illegal or not uh, correct or not mean it was not necessarily illegal. Um, just that uh, we were evaluating what the design intent was. So even though, uh, so that's some evidence that cyclists would prefer not to mix this space with cars if they have the opportunity to not have that space um, from the observations. And then I should note just on this Shero one, the Greenback Sharos, we were pretty, uh, it was a hard evaluation where we wanted the cyclists to go right over the Shero. Um, so many cyclists were in that space, uh, but they were the, to the left or the right of the Shero, mostly to the right, although we didn't actually uh, uh, record that in our data analysis. So that's the, the, you know, those are some clear evidence from user behaviors about the types uh, of designs that work well from that perspective. And then uh, just to highlight, in Washington, D.C., on M Street, which is the couplet in the other direction, um, that's uh, that was designed after L Street. Uh, you can see that this design is almost a hybrid of the Portland design and the DC design. Um, and I would love to be able to put some cameras up and evaluate this one. I suspect it works uh, very well. Um, <laughs> lastly, I should just point out we did look at conflict analysis from the video. Um, there were no uh, major conflicts and no collisions observed. There were a, a handful of very minor conflicts, and so all of the conflicts we observed were very, very far down the conflict scale in terms of severity, which we termed precautionary conflicts. In our previous studies on bike boxes, we didn't even include these precautionary conflicts in our analysis. So these are these are very low type uh, conflict analysis or very low types of conflicts. But one thing to sort of a just and it sort of makes sense. The exposure measure is on the bottom scale, so that's the turning vehicles when a bike is present times the number of bicycles in thousands. And as it, there are more opportunities for more interactions, there are more conflicts. But one thing to note when you come back to this slide to actually calculate the rate, and we have this at other tables, it's the slope of the line back to origin that would be the that would be the rate. And so the mixing zones, these two mixing zones, actually had the highest rate um, of conflict. Um, and the blue ones, which are the turning zones, had slightly lower rates. But uh, again, um, it's difficult for us to draw much conclusions from this analysis, primarily because of the, 
low severity of the conflicts and just the, um, the, the uh, you know, even though we analyzed a lot of hours of video, um, the variations in all of these designs really makes it challenging to draw much conclusions from conflict analysis. Um, so, Chris, can you, just, can you yeah. just define conflict quickly for oh, sure. folks who are listening? Yeah, so conflict would be we, we observed, you know, uh, and we had a sort of a, a standard set of uh, interactions between cars and bicycles based on whether there was, you know, evasive maneuvers, how close they came to each other. So we had a gradation scale. So these are sort of interactions, um, not collisions, but where a car would sort of, you know, would cause a bicyclist to either change direction, stop quickly, um, do some sort of behavior um, to avoid a collision. And these, because at all these locations, they were very low speed, uh, very uh, no, like I mentioned, no major conflicts, no, um, uh, and only a handful of minor conflicts. So uh, they were very low level interactions. Thanks, Hal. Thank you. <laughs> um, so in uh, Chicago, on Dearborn, all of the movements were signalized and separated. So you can see in this picture the left turn signal for at the streets that intersected one way where they needed to turn left. Um, the uh, the vehicle had its own left turn signal separated completely from the bicycle signal with bicycle specific signals. Um, and the pedestrians obviously controlled by the pedestrian signals. So everybody, if they were doing what they were supposed to at these intersections, there would be no conflicts. Um, we still did observe some things because of uh, user, uh, well, you see on the next slide, in terms of both uh, types of users not doing what they were supposed to. But um, so we looked at both people on bicycles, that's the top bar graph, and people in motor vehicles. Um, whether they, the blue bars are whether they waited for the green and, or legal uh, right turn on red um, for the cyclist or whether they basically ran the red light for cyclists. And then on for motor vehicles, whether they turned, uh, whether they illegally turned on the red arrow. Um, and then some of the, that last bar that jumped into crosswalk was where uh, motorists would uh, sort of creep up into the space um, and not stay stopped. And so the the violation rates are roughly, uh, you know, in the same ballpark between seven and eight percent of the cyclists uh, proceeding illegally, as well as the as well as the motorists. There was weren't able to quite determine what the difference was at Dearborn and Madison, um, but these are uh, relatively for, you know, the busy urban area, the compliance rates. So both users are about the same at the at these intersections. So this is the last sort of piece here on the intersection designs. We also asked cyclists sort of what their perceptions were uh, about the safety of going through these intersections. And uh, these are ordered uh, from top to bottom. The Chicago intersections that were completely signalized had the strongest perception of safety, followed by um, the um, mixing zones, uh, the green bars, then the um, then the turning zones, and what you do when it happens when you look at the results is that the safety of the cyclist is really more correlated uh, to the volume of turning vehicles than it really is to the conflicts or any of the design. So at the locations with relatively few motor vehicles turning left or right. Um, the conflict, um, the perceptions of safety were higher. The L Street and the two L Street designs had the highest volume of turning traffic that cyclists had to interact with. Um, we have a whole bunch on buffer. We have a whole paper analysis on the different buffer type, but I just wanted to highlight this one piece. On a, we asked people in a hypothetical sense what their um, comfort level was on a scale from one to six for the different buffer types from just paint to parking protected buffer to a curb protected buffer um, to the flex posts and to the planter separated buffers. This graph shows the different uh, three, the cyclists typed into the three different types and the percent increase 
over a standard bike lane of the different buffer types. And so again, you can this sort of highlights for that interested but concern demographic that the, and you can see as the physical presence of the buffer increases, their percentage increase over their comfort level over a standard stripe bike lane increases much more significantly than any of the other cyclist types. Um, so the one thing also to note is that even though those plastic flex posts provide very little in the way of actually physical protection, um, they still scored relatively high um, in that um, in the perceptions of safety. So you know, and none of those barriers would actually provide any real physical protection from an errant vehicle. So the perceptions, uh, except perhaps the parking the parking protected uh, buffer actually is the biggest uh, physical sense. But there may be some concern from cyclists about the interaction with pedestrians in, you know, getting in, in and out of parked cars. Um, so we're pretty close. I just have a few slides uh, wrapping up on sort of what the rest of the community thought about these uh, protected bikeways. Uh, and that's, a, that's a, a cool mural that I snapped a photo of in San Francisco. Um, so, um, so this slide shows two questions uh, that the facilities encourage bicycling as a way to, to improve public health, and the green bar is I would support building more protected uh, bike lanes at other locations. These are the residents uh, at the top is all residents, so fairly strong support for that for those two statements, but it's also uh, across the primary commute modes, so even people whose primary commute mode is car and truck or, uh, or, or transit or foot also had fairly strong support. And you can clearly see way down at the bottom that people whose primary commute mode is bicycles have the strongest support, but across the spectrum. Um, we also asked a question about the desirability of the neighborhood, and again, um, there was a, a, a pretty uh, a positive uh, reflection across all the commute demographics about that uh, about that question of the desirability of their neighborhood increasing. Um, and then we we also asked some questions about safety of both walking and driving on the street. So these are these were installations meant to increase the safety of bicycling, but there was also some strong um, in some locations, in a way this is sort of facility dependent, but some strong perceptions about the improvement of walking and driving safety in addition to bicycling safety, which we had already saw um, from the cyclist perception was fairly high, but also from the residents' perceptions who may, uh, you know, obviously do walk, bike, and drive on these facilities. So, um, so some strong perceptions from the community perspective. So in terms of conclusions, um, the first conclusion is we saw evidence of increased bicycle volumes. This is mostly within the first year in our uh, assessment that it's mostly due to shifting routes. Um, but there was some evidence that there was attraction um, to some uh, cyclists and some evidence in the general sense that these facilities are attractive to a wider range of cyclists than um, especially that uh, those demographic that that uh, is interested but concerned um, and then the perceptions of safety was uh, was you know was was strong it was consistent across cities um, we saw some gender differences um, that it might be more uh, an improvement experience for women, um, and we saw some evidence that uh, that separation might encourage more cycling from the resident survey. Uh, in terms of the designs, we saw differences um, about how they worked. The conclusion we had about the intersection designs was that that would clear demarcation of the merge entry point and the use of that through bicycle lane was the designs that performed best. Um, there was also evidence from this and other parts of the evaluation that the use of the green markings encouraged cyclists to follow the path the designers intended. So um, that was another observation. The use of the signals on Dearborn in Chicago um, were 
effective, they had the highest perception of safety, um, and uh, also worked well. Um, the designs with buffers with the highest physical separations were preferred, although the flex post scored fairly high too. Um, and then we had uh, generally positive perceptions from other road users. Um, there were some negative perceptions that we didn't highlight here in the interest of time. Those were mainly due to the you know, things that happen specifically on that street. Um, one thing that always came up was parking, um, but interestingly, if you sort of dig into the report, even on streets such as Multnomah where we added, or not we, but their parking was added, that still was a perception that, that parking was uh, negatively impacted by the installation of biking facility, even though there were actually more parking afterwards. So was, uh, perceptions are a uh, piece there. And then uh, there did, from uh, uh, was a strong support for um, the general concept um, and that road users, particularly motorists and uh, people walking, uh, tended to recognize the larger benefits on the of the facility uh, even if there were uh, acknowledged negative components to it. So uh, with that, I'll uh, just point out that um, that short link there gets you to the final report, which is a huge document, has uh, all of the information you could possibly desire about the project and much more. Um, and um, I'll, uh, this will be included and I'll come back to this, but there are a list of references including sort of three papers that are uh, were accepted for publication from this year's TRB uh, and a couple conference presentation papers that uh, dig into a few of the more, a, a few of the topics in a little bit more detail. So with that, how I think. All right, great. Thanks, Chris. Um, you presented some really great information on protected cycling facilities and um, that this has generated about um, 18, 19 questions. I okay. have a feeling we may not get through all of our questions, but we'll um, try. So I'll just okay. take it from the very beginning. So the first question we have is, for these installations, um, what, what, were, what were the lengths of the installation? Oh yeah, like that's a good question. So the, overall, this was uh, six miles of facilities we evaluated, so they were about a mile in length. Some of them were shorter than that. The Rio Grande facility was, um, was fairly short. Um, and so that's a good, que that's a good question. Um, some of these connected to a bigger network, um, and others were sort of uh, uh, isolated uh, in the in the network at this point. So yeah, the Rio Grande was 0.4 miles, Barton Springs was 0.5, um, Dearborn was a mile, DC was a mile, um, Multnomah was a mile. So, good question. Okay. Uh, so the next one is, what is the difference between protected and separated bike lanes? Oh yeah, so I should have pointed that out. So I think there's not, so these, some people are called, you know, these have been called cycle tracks for a while, um, uh, protected bikeways, the FHWA guidance that's coming out uh, prefers separated bikeways. Um, so I think all three of those terms um, are being used to describe these types of facilities. Um, some, we landed on using protect, protected bike lanes, there's some objection to that terminology because there's not really any physical protection except for the parking buffer like I mentioned, mm -hmm. so, um, so I guess there's still some debate on exactly what these should be called, but that's another good question. Mm -hmm. Okay, so with the three northern locations, were those maintained during the winter? Um, yeah, we we don't get any snow in Portland, so um, let's see. In, in but DC, Chicago, the, right? Chicago and DC do, yeah, right. So, um, yeah, they. Um, that's a good question. I, I, it wasn't part of our evaluation. I, I've seen some follow-up notes about how they have to do that. It is definitely a consideration for the protected bikeways to make sure that you have equipment that can both. Uh, uh, sweep and uh, do snow removal that fits in the width. So on all my cross sections and in the report you can see the width of the sections. They ranged from, um, you know, between 8 and 11 feet, but that's definitely an issue. And there is a document that Alta Planning 
has put out on the web that's about sort of winter maintenance for bicycle facilities, and it's got a good discussion about uh, not only being able to plow the facility, but where do you where do you put the snow after you plow it, kind of thing. So, mm -hmm. good question. Okay, great. Um, so, did you educate the drivers about the new facilities or the protected bike cycle tracks? Um, how did you? I did not, um, or we did not, and I don't think there was much, I don't think there was a whole lot of outreach about that. So, um, you know, with the idea that the, the, the design should be self-communicating, and mm -hmm. I think that's, that is, you know, if you got to put up a lot of signs or do a lot of educating um, to make people do what you want them, that's probably not the best design. So, okay. so. So we were evaluating sort of observed behaviors. Okay, so this next question relates to, I believe it was your slide that you had up on the in intersection and type of design. Um, and Mark had noted, it's interesting to note when cyclists felt m most safe, the vehicles and cyclists had the lower rate of correctly using the facility. Can you comment on this? Yeah, I mean, I think that the perception of safety is more related to uh, the volume of turning vehicles than it, than it is to anything else. So some of those facilities um, have had very low left or right turning volume on the order of, uh, you know, 50 or 40 cars an hour in the peak hour. And then, and then to make, um, you know, to add to that, some of those motorists didn't actually enter the mixing zone. They they turn from the other side or or turn from the adjacent lane. And so I think that explains a lot of the perception of safety is just the mixing uh, the mixing with cars. And so um, it would have been nice, I think, if the sort of the conflicts and everything sort of, you know, all lined up in a clear picture, but it didn't happen to be the case. If we had the opportunity, I think the next step is is to look at you know, the design thresholds for these types of, you know, whichever mixing zone seems to kind of rise to the top as sort of being the best, then what are the design thresholds? Do you go from the mixing zone to the turning zone to the signal to the signalization? Because there's clearly, there clearly is somewhere and people have had some thoughts about that, but we weren't able to dig that out from our data. Okay. So your research project really focused on evaluating the perceived safety of bicyclists. Yeah. What, if anything, did you do to evaluate the actual safety of the design? Yeah, so, um, so most of these had not been in long enough actually for even the reported crashes to get through the first, um, you know, to get through basically the DOT cycle. Um, so our study wasn't able to really look at that. I know the uh, forthcoming FHWA report that looked at separated bikeways in the appendix was able to gather some data from uh, New York and a few other cities um, to actually look at some crash data. And then there are some uh, recent papers uh, by Ann Lusk and the team, and uh, Peter Firth looking at safety in Montreal and um, and then in some U.S. cities that has some evidence that these uh, uh, improve crash safety. Okay, great. And then was conflict analysis performed before the treatments were installed? And do you know if the conflicts? Yeah, no. We the these were all after these were all mm -hmm. after evaluations, and um, I think even if I. Yeah, I mean, I think it would have been a reasonable idea to have, uh, you know, a control location, um, but we did not have the budget to do that. So, but in many locations, like on Dearborn, there was no facility to begin with, so you would have had very mm -hmm. few conflicts because there wouldn't have been any bikes on the facility anyways. So, so we really focused on a, is trying to compare and contrast the different designs rather than say anything about the the differences between say a standard bike lane and the protected bike lane. So okay. I don't yeah, this research doesn't have anything to say about that point. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna skip a couple of questions. Did the number of driveway accesses along the corridor have any impact on the level of comfort felt by cyclists or 
did you consider this, and how much variation in the number of accesses, spacing of accesses did you encounter? It's a good question. In San Francisco, it's definitely an issue because there are a lot of residential sort of townhouses in that facility, so there's a lot of driveway access. Mm -hmm. um, we do have in the report a table where we ask cyclists about the different things they incur encountered in the protected bike lane from taxis to um, delivery trucks to, to sticks. Um, so there's some evidence in the report, and I can't recall that off the top of my uh, off the top of my head what, what those were. Um, we did do some video analysis at a hotel loading zone in Washington, D.C., um, and we wanted to do some minor driveway uh, video analysis, but uh, elected to focus on the intersections. So, um, so I agree that that's, I mean, that's another good question. That's another place where there are conflicts, um, and there are some design ideas about how to treat that. Um, mm -hmm. but we did not have the time to study that. Okay, so I'm going to combine these two questions. Um, they relate to more of the economics of the um, facilities. So the first one is, do many residents say protected bike lanes decrease the value of their neighborhoods at all? Um, no, I think um, I, that was the last slide. Um, Um, so I think the the balance of those blue bars uh, were neutral, um, mm -hmm. so there wasn't a whole lot of negative response, but I would have to double check that. Okay. And then were any surveys done to collect businesses' perspectives um, as opposed to just residents? Yeah, no, we, we uh, did not do that. Uh, we wanted to, um, but in our past experience, yeah, that is a challenging uh, thing to do in a comprehensive manner across okay. across all five cities we ruled that out as feasible okay. um, this relates to the demographics any of the demographics of bicyclists indicating that some users are less than 16 years of age um, oh, as my students love we have a bonus slide <laughs> um, <laughs> on the demographics, um, and here I, you know, I only have it broken out by uh, less than 35, um, but we wouldn't have uh, allowed somebody to complete the survey if they were less than 18 um, mm -hmm. because of our um, IRB rules, so we, if, they, if we intercepted them and they gave us their age, they would have got kicked out of the survey, so, right. um, so one thing to note about the demographics between the cyclists there um, you know there were fewer women in the cyclist intercept survey than there were um, in the resident survey um, and uh, but other than that they were pretty comparable um, the residents and the cyclist and the resident survey was comparable to the uh, census tract in the surrounding area yeah, and and the um, person who asked it said that he he or she asked it because uh, they are not trained on road rules. So no. that was just the context of that. Okay. And so we only have time for me for one more question, um, and it's really hard to choose which question to ask. But I'm going to ask this one on um, signalized inter intersections. So. <laughs> Um, the question is, based on your research, would you say it is true that the fully signalized intersection is the safest intersection design? And if not, what factors make an intersection design safe? Well, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't work everywhere, but um, in principle, it would be the safest design if everybody obeys the you know, their space and time, then there are, there's no opportunity, there's no opportunity for collision. So, mm -hmm. um, so, um, so I would expect as long as compliance is high and you would need to put it in a place where you would, uh, that it would be warranted, um, that it would perform uh, the best. So mm -hmm. I think anytime, obviously, where you sort of force uh, 
cycles, cyclists and vehicles to merge or share space, there's an opportunity for a collision. Okay, great. So we have a, uh, about a dozen questions that, are, that were left unanswered, so um, we're hoping that uh, Chris will respond to them and we, we will email you uh, his responses to those questions. Um, but I want to take this, this opportunity to thank Chris again for his great pr presentation on protected cycling facilities. Um, and this concludes our webinar. Thank you so much for joining us today, and thanks again uh, to Chris for sharing your work. And we are looking for your feedback so that we can continue to offer relevant webinars in the future. So please be on the lookout for an email that includes a short evaluation survey. Uh, we will also be in touch with you with the responses to the questions that didn't get answered, as well as information on professional development credits. Um, and, uh, and as always, you can view other professional development offerings on our website at www.nitsi.us. And thank you again. Yes, thank you.